Mark. So you might know this. I'm, I'm Mark Williams. Um, you might remember me from a talk called uh, Test the Right Themselves and uh, meetups such as this one. I'm a co-organizer. Uh, right now, I'm a freelance, freelance software engineer. Um, I specialize in data engineering, uh, general infrastructure, kind of hand-waving, uh, and DevOps, because that's unavoidable. Um, working in and near DevOps, being kind of adjacent to that and working directly with it, and certainly working with infrastructure, has led me to form some opinions about Docker. So how many people here know what Docker is? Good, because this is not going to be an intro talk. I'm going to change your mind. I'm going to bring you into the fold of Dr. Skeptics, because I'll admit, I am a skeptic of new technologies. Um, kind of that's like a, I'm like risk averse because I work in DevOps and infrastructure. You know, something sounds really cool and it's new. It's like fun to use. But if it breaks, nobody knows how to fix it because it's new. And that always will break during your vacation or while you're sleeping. So. I'm definitely a skeptic of new technologies, um, especially ones that are ambitious, because the bigger the plans, the higher you fly, the farther you have to crash. So that means I'm kind of a skeptic of Docker. Um, I've looked at Docker a bunch of times, going back to like 2012, 2013, 2014. Took a break in 2015, took it easy. 2016, I looked at it again. And each time, I found that it wasn't really suitable for what I wanted it to do and what it was marketed to me to do. Um, since then, I've taken a look at it again in 2017. Uh, and I have actually been using it um, for some important stuff, that part of my contracting, so it's like helping me eat. So uh, I've changed my opinion of it a little bit, and I think I have a more measured view. Um, so I'd like to start with like what's good about it. Good thing about Docker is that it's a fresh look at applications. What does that mean? Well, that when I said it was ambitious, um, it, it means that it's like reimagining what it means to write an application. Um, it's mostly targeted, like obviously targeted at server software. So like a web server or mail servers, that kind of thing, right? Not interactive stuff. Um, back in the day when we wanted to like build and deploy these, we would build daemons. I don't know if anybody remembers this. I'm sure people have written their own demonization code. Um, if, though, if you're not aware, in the world of Unix, daemon has a very precise technical definition. It means a program that no longer has a controlling terminal. Um, and that actually means that there's no interactivity. It's not part of an interactive session. So it's running in the background, you might say. Although that means something specific with shells, it's running like nobody had to log in to start it. Um, turns out it's actually really hard to write a daemon correctly. Um, that precise technical definition means there's like a long checklist in um, advanced Unix programming interface. There's like seven things you have to do just in a very particular way. It doesn't sound that hard. It's actually surprisingly hard to get right. Um, one thing that happens a lot when you write these kinds of programs is that you have all these implicit dependencies. Um, that means that like it's easy to write a daemon. You're like, oh yeah, I just need to like print something to the like the log file, and I'm going to use like f puts to do that. Well, you got a dependency that's libc. That's not too surprising, but if you want to do I don't know some kind of image thing, you might have a dependency on libjpg all of a sudden, right? And like in this modern world of like pip and everything, that's not too surprising. But when you are trying to ship and deploy software, that can be very annoying because you have all these surprising things that you didn't know you actually needed. And that they just like cropped up a lot when you write traditional server software. Um, oh, what happened? Something changed. Um, also, this is like, we talked about how this had a particular meaning in Unix. A uh, thing that kind of sucks about Unix is that it has what's called ambient authority. Um, so the Unix permissions model is not very granular, traditionally. The real, like the level, the unit of permissioning is the user. So like you could have two different users, and you can say that they're not part of the same group, so they can't write to each other's files. They can't see each other's files. And this is useful, but this means that if you run, unless you factor your program up into, into separate programs that run under different users, this is called privilege separation. And it's a thing you can do, but it's now you have a distributed system that has to like have complicated IPC mechanisms. Unless you do that, you everything that's running in that process under a user can do anything that that user can do. So like it's really easy to write a server, it accidentally leaks like your TLS keys to people. Like, not that that ever happened to Cloudflare. Like that, that's a thing that like happens all the time, right? And so this is like a known problem with Unix, where it's really easy. It's easy to do things you shouldn't do. Um, and as I said, demonization is easy to get wrong. Uh, a lot of people will start a daemon from an interactive shell. I said at the beginning, it's not supposed to be part of an interactive session. Well, how many of you started G Unicorn from your like interactive shell? I, I know I have done that before. Um, 
The problem with that is like there are a bunch of things that make sense for your interactive shell that have now bled into that process. Environment variables are like the classic example. Your path could be pointed at something insane. Um, so like best practice is to have a separate program that starts it. It's, it's very complicated. So Dockerized applications um, take a very different approach to this. So you have to explicitly pin down your dependencies. The reason for this is that what runs is called a container. There's a runtime artifact that exists only in memory, and that's called a container. And it's an instance of an immutable foundation, something that does not change once it's created. And that immutable foundation is called an image. So you can right now see that's like a powerful division of responsibilities, because if you can spin up a container from an immutable image, like you could scale up a web application, right? Everything you need is kind of implicit in that. So there's like, that seems like a really interesting and powerful concept. Additionally, because images are immutable, um, each instance is the same as every other. So there's like, and images are built from Docker files. So there's this sense of like, you have a recipe to get from like your Docker file to an image and then from an image to many containers. So that whole implicit dependency thing it kind of goes away because you have to explicitly put the stuff into the into the image, and once it's there, it's there for good. Um, so you have like a lot of what you would expect out of say Chef or Puppet or other configuration management systems. You kind of get as part of the Docker experience, and that's known to be like configuration management systems are known to be a best practice in DevOps. So that's pretty cool. That's nice. And finally, um, you don't demonize ever. Um, they say, oh, I skipped something. Oh, right, I skipped one. Uh, Dockerized applications have to ask what they need, ask for what they need, and this is like the, the container does. So like there are things you cannot do in the container. Um, a classic example, I don't know how many of you people like to S-trace your processes when they do something you don't expect. Like every day, yeah. So you can't do that with Docker by default. If you can connect to the Docker container and get a shell, you can't S-trace it because the Docker container, everything in the Docker container has given up the capability to attach to processes with ptrace, which is the kernel facility on which strace is like built. So like this is an example of how there's like a very small surface of functionality that Docker provides for your application. You have to ask for additional things. So that kind of combats the ambient authority problem, which is pretty nice. And finally, you don't demonize. So like that seven item checklist that's easy to mess up. Um, for when you write a daemon, you don't have to worry about that because your programs aren't doing a double fork to like drop the controlling terminal. They don't have to like CD into slash to make sure they don't hold on to mounts that you know would not be able to be unmounted. All this horrible stuff goes away because you're not doing that. You just start your program the way that you normally would start a program. So that's nice. Um, it's like not totally like an, uh, uh, an original concept. This might sound familiar if you've ever done static linking. Um, this idea that you're going to pack everything together into an artifact that has everything you need to run is very much related, I think, to static linking. So back in the day, this is how all programs were compiled. So you'd have a program, you'd have a thing called a linker that would copy in the dependencies. We're talking about code right now, but the idea is similar. Like if you wanted, when I said I wanted to use F puts in my like, in my C program, in my daemon, the linker would go grab the definition of outputs and I copy it into the executable. And the end result of this is that executable is ready to go. It doesn't have to go find any code anywhere. So that executable has all the dependencies that it needs. So a Docker file, you can kind of think of like your configure script and your make file because it tells you how to build this image, right? And the image is like a process, is like the executable. And indeed in like systems nomenclature, when you talk about the artifact on the disk, that the like kernel will load into memory and run. That's called the process image, right? They generate a process image. So there's like a little bit of overlap of terminology even. And so the image ends up being kind of like a statically ex linked executable and the container is like the running version of that, right? So there's like some overlap here and it's a proven technology. That's cool, right? That's nice. And you might've heard there's this little program language that's kind of popular recently, it's called Go. It's only statically linked, and people laud Go for how easy it is to deploy because you end up with a single executable, you plop that down on a computer, and you run. You don't ever see that giant traceback you see with pip when it complains about not finding like libxml's header files or something, right? So that's nice. But it turns out, unfortunately, uh, that we've talked about static linking in like the whole programming world for a long time. And I don't want to get too much into how like things work now, but that we left that behind years ago. We like C programs will use shared libraries. And basically what this means is your program, what would be an image in Docker, has a reference 
to code that it needs and where you might go look for that code. And at runtime, a special program, it's part of your operating system, goes and grabs it and puts it, like copies it at runtime into memory. That sounds kind of crazy and some people don't like that. But the advantage is if you change the code that's getting copied, all the programs that copy it instantaneously get a benefit from that. So like the classic example of the benefit of shared libraries is OpenSSL because, hey, we upgrade OpenSSL like once every two weeks, right? So with shared libraries, if you have a, a program that is dynamically linked against the libssl shared library, you upgrade that once, all the programs that use it get a benefit from that. So there's this like ease of rolling forward with security releases. Um, you don't have to even know how to like recompile your programs. And like if you have closed source stuff, that might be really important because you can't recompile it. Now, this is of debatable value as Go demonstrates. Not everybody is convinced of the value of this. Um, PIP, as an example, has a vendor directory that carries its own copy of requests because there's I mean, PIP has to bootstrap stuff. But like you'll see evidence of this even in Python where people will do an anal analogous thing to static linking. So like this isn't a, a written story, but it's worth bringing up the security benefits of shared libraries. There's no, there's an analogous problem with Docker images. Let's say that you base your Docker file on some image foo, and then you need to upgrade libssl. Well, you have to go rebuild all of your images. Maybe that image is based on another image, and you have to trace back to the chain of images to find out where libssl is and make sure that it gets upgraded, right? If you were just running a virtual machine, and you're running, say, Debian, there's an unattended upgrades program that you would just plug into cron, and in the background, it would update stuff. Following like security updates, you can give it a policy to apply stuff. There's no analogous thing to automatically build secure, like rebuild your Docker images to get security benefits. This is a big problem. This is a big problem. And as far as I know, there's no consensus on how to deal with this in in the Docker world. One of the things that makes this hard is that it's really difficult to like pin down what these concepts are because you know Docker is very ambitious. Um, that means that there's like a like a lot of words that we have to use when we talk about Docker. And a lot of these words are, you know, they're, they're marketing terms. They're fancy terms, like, like cute little phrases that describe things that are actually really complicated and subtle concepts that you have to understand if you're going to use Docker effectively. Um, and a great example of this is the fact containers don't exist. This is not a contentious statement I, because I'm actually quoting Jesse Frizzell, who is truly an expert, and her blog's great. So if you just want to follow that link and read that for the rest of the presentation, I would not be offended. It's really good. Um, but they don't, containers don't have, like, you read about them in Docker's literature. People talk about containers. I talked about containers. They actually are a composite of two very unrelated technologies in the Linux kernel, control groups and namespaces. You can have control groups without namespaces and vice versa. Control groups organize processes and let you meter resource usage. So you could say, oh, this group of processes can only use these many CPU shares, which means they can't run amok with your CPU. Namespaces, which are a honking great idea that we should have more of, as you might know from Python, isolate things. So you can have a mount namespace. And that means that two different processes can have two different ideas of what slash means. Um, these are really, this may seem like splitting hairs, but it's important to bring this up. Um, because it leads to inconsistencies, weird inconsistencies. The reason for this, in the article from the previous slide, um, Jesse Frizzell compares containers to things that actually are like reified concepts for their operating systems, Solaris zones and FreeBSD jails. I'll take jails as an example because I have more experience with FreeBSD. FreeBSD has a base system. That means that when they do a release of FreeBSD, they also do a release of LS, like the program LS that you type, or they do a release of find and cron. All that stuff comes together in one chunk. So when you say that you're going to spin up a jail with a FreeBSD 10.3 release, you have a very precise idea of what that means. That's not true with containers. I mean, not just because we have, there's no such thing as containers. There's no such thing as a base system with Linux. Linux is, as you may have heard from Richard Stallman, just a kernel, right? And one way that we deal with this is we have distributions that provides software to run around that kernel, right? It provides user space stuff. And a lot of Docker images start with some distribution that's idea of what a base system is. So like Debian-based ones, like Debian and Ubuntu, will use Deb Bootstrap, which has an idea of necessary packages. That includes GNU core utils. So when you type ls in that container, or you run ls in that container, you get GNU's version. Other like Docker images 
that you want to pull from Docker Hub, they use Alpine, which uses BusyBox. So when you type LS, you get a very different implementation. So if you were trying to run a program that you expects a particular like set of command line arguments for LS, well, now you have to be very sensitive to which Docker image you're basing your, your, your image on. And if you go to Docker Hub, it doesn't immediately say we use Alpine Linux, right? Like for my contract work, bear with me, I had to install PHP and MySQL. I know, um, it's fine. Um, and when I chose one of the library, one of the, the images on Docker Hub, it occurred to me that I assumed that it was Ubuntu and it wasn't. It was actually like CentOS. And so that meant that like I was going to install some software. I had to install some other software that expected it be a particular version of Ubuntu and it wasn't available for CentOS. And there was nothing on, there's nothing on Docker Hub that says when you pull this PHP MySQL, it is going to be CentOS. So you have to manually trace through that lineage of images to find out what you're even getting. And this can be really bad because it turns out Alpine also doesn't use libc, it uses Musil. Now, I like Musil because static linking is cool to have a second like implementation of libc. Standard C library, that's where F puts would live. Musil is not exactly compatible with libc. Not only will some things not compile, worse yet, things will compile, but you will find out that you were using Musil because your program seg faults. So this is like the worst possible thing where like, hey, I didn't even need to install anything. I got this great image off of Docker Hub. I just ran with it. And I'm like, why is I, why do I keep getting seg faults? Oh, right. It's actually Alpine. So this is like, it makes it really difficult to rely on Docker Hub. And unfortunately, like that's a big selling point for Docker Hub. The idea that like you can snap your fingers and have your PHP MySQL stuff ready to go. Right. I mean, these things can be very difficult to set up. So it would be nice to be able to rely on that. And this is one very big reason in my experience that makes it difficult to rely on that. I think the genesis of that, the genesis of this inconsistency that's so problematic, um, is a very reductionist perspective. Um, I think that Docker has like decided that simplicity is very powerful. And I think that that's true. Simplicity is obviously a very powerful, like, way to a like if you try to figure out the simplest possible way to do it you can ship faster and it allows like novel composition of different parts like there are good parts to simplicity on the other hand it can lead to really weird edge cases because you're focused so much on like the simple use cases you don't see how these things combine and furthermore it often requires like a lot of work to do very simple tasks like i'm sure that like if you want to find I'm trying to think of a good example, but if you've ever had to like write what seems like it's going to be a simple find invocation, like the find find one, like you're like, oh, I'm just going to go find all the files made in the last like day, and then I'm going to check what their like SHA-1 is, or sorry, SHA-256 is, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm going to check what their SHA-256 is, and if it looks like, if it's like not my approved list, I'm going to delete it. It's not fun to write that with find. Um, even though it composes well, like, it's hard, it's, it takes a lot of like effort to put that together because they common use cases aren't encoded in the, in the, in the, in the command line like interface, right? This is exactly how Unix is, right? Back in the day, this is what people complained about with Unix. Unix made it really easy, like you, everything is a file, right? Except everything that is not a file, right? So like Unix has this simplifying assumption where every important thing is going to be a file and you can call read or write on it, right? The system calls read or write. That's not true because you can randomly seek in a file, but you can't randomly seek in a pipe. So that abstraction gets a little broken. Um, and if anybody's ever looked at Java's IO APIs, you can see how difficult it is to like fit that dimension in to, uh, the, to like the concept of a file. Sockets are even worse, right? Nobody ever uses like read or write on a socket, really. They use receive or they use receive message because you have very specific things you need to talk to the socket about. Like, hey, socket, I asked for 1,024 bytes. Just don't just block until you have that ready, right? You can't communicate that with the read API. You have to use receive message for that or receive. So this is a simplifying assumption that breaks down in practice. And it leads to like kind of crappy APIs. Like, I don't know that send message is actually that great in the API. Um, maybe if they had thought about this, if they had the foresight or whatever, we could reapproach that. You might end up with a better API 30 or 40 years later. And Docker knows, unlike the Sockets API, which I think started off rather unambitious, it was just going to make all the computers in the world talk to each other. But it was just a stream of bytes, right? Like that concept is relatively straightforward from an API perspective. Docker has like starts, starts off by like wanting to promise you the world. So I I'm giving it a little bit of a harder time than, than I would give like a historical API. Um, 
So an example of one of these simplifying assumptions, right, is that, oh, your application, it just, it's going to run by itself. We're not going to stick any other crud in there. You know, you have all these things running on a Unix machine. Like you have cron running in the background. You have like XM4 or God help you send mail. Like we don't need any of that. We don't need any of that. Your entry point, the thing that Docker is going to run, that's going to run as PID1. And that sounds really cool, except when you try to do anything <laughs> that involves signals or processes. And to be fair, signals are the worst. But um, so with processes, like a little bit of Unix trivia, trivia for you that maybe you've bumped into, if you spawn a process, we call that the child, if its parent terminates, that process becomes a child of init. And when that process terminates, something has to retrieve its exit status to find out did it succeed, exit successfully. Was there a problem? So it's going to hang out. Its entry is going to hang out in the kernel's process table until somebody goes and says, hey, whatever happened to that process? And by convention, that's in it when the parent has terminated before the child. If nothing calls wait on it, it hangs around forever. And PIDs are a scarce like, resource. There are only like 32,000 PIDs on a default like configured Linux machine. So if your process is in it, you better be prepared to reap child processes that like, or like processes you didn't know anything about. And if your program isn't prepared to do that, and most programs are not, then you're going to, if you spawn any stuff that isn't really well behaved, if you spawn any parent process or any process that does not wait on its children, you're going to accrue zombies. This is a big enough problem. So we called zombies because they're waiting to die. Yes. Jokes. <laughs> Unix has all the jokes. Um, so... This is enough of a problem that like Yelp wrote a big blog post about it. They have a thing called dumb in it. I know for a fact that certain large corporations also ran into this issue. Um, also, there's a related to the way that signals are handled in it. One will like it's it's easy to make PID one ignore signals if you're not prepared to do it, which will lead to weird things. So skip through that. You can talk to me about signal handling. I love it so much. Um, also, the default user's root. We're right back to ambient authority, right? If you don't put a user directive, a user command in your Docker file, you're root. And now it's true that with the capabilities framework in Linux, it's given up a lot of what it can do. But root is root. You can still clobber files you didn't intend to. So it's great that they have like curbed ambient authority in some ways, but it's a shame that they didn't actually like make it required. Just tell me what user you need to run under. Um, so the worst, I, I mean, I think that like the worst part of that from an experiential perspective, like like actually dealing with Docker is that like you have this big pile of tools because of all the, like every time they build something, they're like, well, we're going to build the simplest thing. And then somebody says, well, we need to do this. And the answer is, well, we just need more Docker. We're going to build you a new tool to use to solve that problem that we, eh, we kind of like punted down the road. We'll solve it with more Docker. So like as an example, Docker files are really limited, right? You have a very small set of commands. And there's no way to specify a runtime dependency on another container, right? So that is to say that if my PHP container needs to talk to my SQL, there's no way to say that in Dockerfile. Maybe it's a good idea to have that not part of your Dockerfile, but it's the case that you can't express that. Well, good news is we have Docker Compose, right? Which will allow you to put dependencies that to, to articulate runtime dependencies. But the problem with Docker Compose is that it doesn't like scale out well, right? It has nothing to do with like if you have if you want to have like a bunch. Remember we talked about how great like images versus containers was because you could spin up a ton of containers for one image. There's nothing for that in Docker Compose, so you can't take that to production. You have to use Kubernetes or Swarm or DCOS, and all of these are completely different from each other. There's no easy path from Docker file to Compose. That's the easiest, but there's no easy path from Compose to like Kubernetes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. Use Minikube. Come on. Um, so all the APIs are actually kind of crummy, too, if you ask me. I know that there were some complaints about the fact that there's one layer. So when Docker, like if you ever run Docker file and you see like like a line and then like some weird output with UUIDs and then a line and some, it's actually creating like a cache for every single line of the Docker file, which is kind of nutty because maybe you could just let me tell you what I want cache because I might know something about like the dependencies of my code. So it'd be cool if you could do that. And why don't they syntax check it up front? Right? Like if I have a syntax file like issue at the very bottom of my Docker file and I'm loading tons of like I'm spinning up my MySQL database and I'm shoving 1.8 gigabytes of stuff into that MySQL database. And it takes a couple of minutes because my laptop's not that fast. And then I have a really dumb syntax error at the last line. I'm not going to find out about that until I waited a couple of minutes to to like for my MySQL to load. Why don't they just syntax check it? It would be nice if they did that. 
Um, but you know, reductionist perspective, let's keep it simple. Syntax checking, that's way too complicated. Just use ed. It's the standard editor. <laughs> and I mean, the the worst, I mean, to summarize this, like I think that it's new technology, like the worst part, the ugliest part of this is it's new technology, which means new bugs, as I said, like um, I've had volumes refuse to unmount for some reason. Like it just the Docker container won't shut down. It's just I couldn't unmount the. I like somebody didn't unmount this. I'm like Docker, that's your problem. But they did not unmount it. And then I actually had a hard lock on my laptop. My laptop froze. I have a recent version of the kernel too. It's not like it's very old. I saw that unregistered net device. Like what is that? Is a PC load letter? That's that's really not helpful. And if you Google this, people are like, yeah, it's fixed. And people are like, no, it is not fixed. There's no clear consensus on. What do you do with this? So it's and it's fair. It's a new technology. They're using these things that are relatively new. So it's to, to be expected that you'll have strange edge cases. But this is a problem if you want to productionalize it. And sometimes the Docker daemon just freezes, and you just got to restart it. Um, so what does this all mean? Am I telling you not to use Docker? No, no. I, I use Docker. Um, I've been recommending it to people because there's real value there, as we talked about with the implicit dependencies and stuff. Immutable infrastructure is great. Um, and if everybody, everybody's using Docker, like if I can communicate to somebody, you know, here's how you spin up a development environment, you just run a couple of commands, even if it works 90% of the time, a lot of the times a company or team or group of people working together have something that works 0% of the time. So 90% of the time is a big improvement. So it solves some problems, but it also introduces new problems. And so maybe when you are looking at Docker, you take a step back and you think about what your problems actually are. An example, if you don't have a way to manage database changes like migrations or just checked in SQL somewhere, if you have no way to spin up a database from scratch, forget about Docker. Go work on that. That will give you way more in terms of like a productivity game than, than anything that Docker is going to do. Docker doesn't have a solution for that. If you don't have tests, if you don't have automated tests or your tests are flaky, don't worry about Docker because how are you going to know if anything works when you do switch over to Docker? So a lot of times you might find the Docker is brought up in your company where people talk about Docker like it's a silver bullet. There's no such thing as a silver bullet. And there's no such thing as a free lunch. So keep that in mind when you switch to Docker. Evaluate it fairly. But there's no magic there. And that's it. Questions. Uh, questions. Uh -oh. I know there's got to be a few. I so if there's any technical, l l let's see some hands. Yeah. If there's technical inaccuracies. I'm just going to say I'm trolling you. <laughs> That's like the classic defense for being wrong about something. Uh, I didn't spot any any technical inaccuracies, but uh, <laughs> I'm curious. You said you looked at Docker in like uh, 12 mm -hmm. and 13, 14, 15. What do you think was uh, deficient in Docker at those times that you looked at it that uh, you either solved now or went away or yeah. Um. I'd say two big things pop out to me. Um, one was like going back to like 2012, 2013. So this is a while ago. Docker just called into LXC. Um, so LXC is a suite of tools, Linux containers, um, that's that was actually developed by Canonical. Um, and it's a it's it's also very Unixy in that you have like a little program that will create a container and a little program that'll run a something in a container and another little program that'll flip some switches for like user namespaces. And so I, people were all excited about Docker in like 2012 and 2013, and hey, it's open source. So I went and read it, and like 90% of the code was like serving image, like a web server to serve images, like they're the concept of of Docker images, and like the rest of it was just LXC. So, like I'm immediately suspicious of it because I had experience with LXC, and I know LXC can, is temperamental. So like, what happens when there's an LXC failure? Now I have to think about how Docker is interpreting that. So I immediately went. Like when I was doing container stuff in 2012, 2013, I just stuck with LXC because I know when it breaks what it's telling me versus like when LXC breaks, it tells Docker this and then Docker tells me like a second, secondary effects are hard to reason about. The other thing that happened was Docker grew a secret secrets management tool within like the last year or so that's actually fantastic. And Docker definitely wants, so secrets management means like, what, how do you get passwords into your applications? This is, of course, a huge pain when you try to operationalize something. And Docker has like a really good answer to this, that it has a nice API to it. It's implemented correctly. Um, I have high confidence that it's not going to leak your secrets. That's, that's worth a lot. That's worth a lot. And they've made improvements in other things like 
there's like a prune command to Docker, uh, it, like to remove images that no longer have tags, which didn't exist for like four or five years. They got it like in December of 2016. So there are other incremental improvements, but those two things stuck out to me. The fact that they like actually implemented their own container runtime so that when there are errors, it wasn't just like me trying to figure out how they misused LXC. And then they developed a really compelling feature that like other people just don't have. Like there's no puppet. Well, there is a puppet answer to secrets, but it's not as good. <laughs> Do you want Great to answer. More questions, Kurt. So, sorry, it's not exactly a question. I just wanted to like <laughs> stand up, you know, Docker Holics Anonymous, and share my favorite problem with Docker files. <laughs> they have this yes. like command thing, where, which is which is like execute something as if it were a bash shell, right? Mm -hmm. And somewhere along the line, somebody said, you know what? Uh, just putting a raw string in there is bad because you get into like shell splitting of stuff. And they said, you know, it'd be better. Let's give like a JSON list. But then they didn't add like a separate command that takes a JSON list and one that takes a string. What they did is they try to always parse it as JSON. And if that parse fails, it must have been a string. <laughs> so is that why they can't do like static syntax <laughs> so checking? Can, you, you like leave a comma out or you don't close this, then it just like passes that whole JSON blob, you know, to bash or whatever. <laughs> so like, will it actually, will batch in, in, interpret like the open bracket as like the test command? I, I, Could I write an like a command that is parsable both as JSON and a test <laughs> command? Can I write a quine with this? Yeah, I'm gonna go home. Let's... That sounds like the thing to make Docker file reliable. You should get on that. <laughs> <laughs> Docker Holics Anonymous is a pretty good idea. My, I mean, my favorite the thing about Docker is how like every time you have a problem, you Google for it, and you don't get Stack Overflow, you don't get anything. You just get GitHub issues of Moby, <laughs> right? And there's an issue that was opened in 2014. And then you follow it to the bottom. It's like closed in favor of this other issue right. open in 2016. Like, you know, and then it closed in favor of this issue that was open later in 2016. And that one's got like 80 different comments and it's still open now. It was just like somebody commented on it like 40 minutes ago. Like, what do you mean you still haven't fixed this? <laughs> <laughs> it's really, uh, it, and it happens every single time. So uh, I'm glad we're having this. And uh, and the docs, the Somebody's docs themselves it. will link to like probably if you do like a, a, a thing like the the top link is to either GitHub issues or Go docs because uh, basically you Docker just, just defines like right yeah. it's like look well, our behavior for this is just whatever Go does right and so like you know it could could change. be simpler yeah it's obvious so so like we parse a URL like how Go does and we parse a JSON how Go does and we don't know how that is we'll just link to that um, so. <laughs> You know, I mean, they Less at least they link. <laughs> at least they didn't pretend like they invented it. Uh, but yeah, Docker Holics Anonymous should become like a recurring thing. Any Need other like this. really good stories or questions? Questions. Yeah. Moshe? All right. So add is a command to either uh, put a file in your Docker oh, or expand uh, uh, a tarball or a zip file. It will do it automatically if it's double or zip file. It'll also or fetch a URL. That's it. Yes, it yeah. will fetch a URL for you if you uh, add a URL. What trust um, route does it use for SSL? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, not a. That, that was a joke. That, don't answer that. <laughs> no, Go Go actually has a decent TLS. Yeah, they, that's thing. what they copied for cryptography 2.0, I think. <laughs> Cooper, did you Who's think you could beat that one? <laughs> so Facebook doesn't use Docker. No, okay. I'm surprised that they can scale without Docker. <laughs> okay, Roy? So, so kind of with that, one thing that I noticed with uh, Docker is that there is like quite the hype train around it, right? Like someone sees a Hacker News article, they go to a meetup, they like see Docker and they come and tell everyone in the organization it's going to fix all the problems and spend some un unknown amount of time trying to do 140 so. million dollars of vc money like or or they you know have yeah, a multi-billion no dollar valuation that's with, all real with no business model <laughs> um i'm interested as someone who's like actually used docker yeah sorry <laughs> first let's like check to a show on some docker um but as someone who's actually using it in, in production i'm interested to kind of hear your take on like how do you handle tempering expectations how do you think about like uh, I, i'm gonna be honest with you i haven't done it successfully um, I, the times that I've, um, evaluated it, like 2012, 2013, 2014, I said no each time and nobody listened to me. <laughs> um, and as far as I know, none of those deployments were very successful. And so I think that I don't have a great answer for that. I think like any technology, one way that you do it is you develop enough, you have somehow expertise on hand that can put together something that shows how it works and how it doesn't work. 
And I think that this is a larger problem when building like real systems that we don't confront, which is when you demo something or when you talk about something, you have to also show its failure modes. Nobody does this, right? It's very counterintuitive, certainly, if you're going to have a demo where it's like, look at how fast it is. And by the way, I'm going to make it fail for you right now. Like, that doesn't sound exciting. But if that's a process that you can build into your engineering culture, it's easy to combat hype. And it's also easy to have, like, postmortems. It's a lot of, like, good practices come out of that. So I've focused on that to try to be like, we need to think about what the failure modes are. Um, and I think that's maybe even more successful. Ask me in two years. <laughs> <clears throat> Thoughts, comments, thoughts, comments on this important technology of our time? So sad. <laughs> Are they even still in business? Yeah, I mean, CoreOS is kept al alive somehow. Alex is keeping it going. Mo Moshe gives it a... Moshe, Moshe is, is not a buy on CoreOS uh, options right it's now. It's a system D, right? Oh, oh, I see. Uh, yes, Moshe did uh, have some uh, <laughs> recruiting style interaction with CoreOS, and he reports that they do not offer such a... I mean, they offer, depending on how you want to look at it, a very competitive salary. <laughs> 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 They're really competing uh, with themselves. Okay. Um, yeah. Calling it? Okay, yeah, that's, that, that's great. Okay. No, I, I actually let him go over time because he was doing such a great job. Give it Aww. up for Mark, everyone.